How did we get here? In the span of a few decades, we went from TV that was all about genie dreaming, Brady bunching, bay watching, to pick your prestige TV poison, the bear, madness, the shield, crown, the the white lotus, the cream, the salt, obsession, the 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 and as the best of these shows, Better Call Saul, proves, TV has become the ultra cinematic, beautiful, tense home of high art, while movies, well... He was in the Amazon with my mom when she was researching spiders right before she died. Seriously, how does a show that literalizes the depths of despair come from the same medium that produced... Hey, great! Now we've got a furnished basement! You might think that this is a story about streaming or our changing culture. You see, right around the turn of the millennium, people went from dumb and lame to cool and smart. I call this process cool smartification. This is about a change that no one predicted, but one where business and technology intertwine. And it's one that teaches us how stories are told. Okay, so I think to understand why TV got so good, you have to understand why it was bad, how the business and tech led to stuff like, and then I do that. And to understand the tech part, I need this. I know, I know, you think this is gonna be another gratuitous Apple Vision Pro video, but I found a tool that is actually pretty helpful to demonstrate how much television technology has changed. I mean, we are gonna go back to a time that is really different. When TV hosts actually read the sponsorships, I mean, it's like hard to even imagine. Again. All right, sorry about that. And I actually need to tell you about today's sponsor, which is Incogni. They are the first sponsor for this channel. Very exciting. Thank you very much for doing it, Incogni. And you know, if you're like me, you probably actually have gotten a lot of calls like this. So what does Incogni do? Um, I don't need to tell you that the information landscape now is very different than it was in the 1950s. There are data brokers out there that have and want to sell or use your email, your address, your phone number, all sorts of information about you. But you can send Incogni out there to kind of go stop it. Last Friday, I signed up for Incogni and I filmed the process of trying to get my name right. out of the hands of some of those data brokers. I am actually kind of excited about this. <laughs> Whoa, that's cool. It has this thing that says hours saved. Oh my gosh. I just power washed my porch and I feel like I'm about to power wash my identity. <laughs> All right, so now I'm gonna check out the progress today. They've been working over the weekend to clear my name. <laughs> you can get this risk-free for 30 days with their 30 days money back guarantee. Try it out, see how you like it and go from there and you will get off some of these lists. You'll get less spam, less calls. Um, so please join me on this journey. Go to incogni.com slash Phil Edwards. I'm very Proud of myself for having a link that has my name at the end. It's very exciting for me. Click the link, support the channel, and you will get 60% off the annual plan. Thank you, Incogni. And now let's get back to the video. Whoa. Okay, somewhat ironically, I have to turn off my TV. I actually found this app that can let you put televisions anywhere, and it's super useful. This TV is 43 inches, and this guy is the typical size of an older TV. There's a huge difference here. I mean, look at this one. Look how small the screen is here. I feel sorry for these people. This is embarrassing. Just look at this Admiral TV ads, 1950, with a 16 inch picture tube, only 499. Let's not even mention that that would be $6,385.90 today. This 1953 adds a little better with a 17 inch and 21 inch TV. We are talking about an image that was black and white and tiny and low resolution, right? I mean, look at this thing. TVs were wide, heavy, low to the ground, small, low res. This is just fundamentally different from a movie theater. Oh, her web connects them all. Color TVs like these, still small, still grainy, still low and heavy. They weren't even mainstream until well into the 1960s. I'd forgotten how close people sat to TVs. There's a reason these kids are getting so close. This thing is tiny. The President of the United States did it. 
media critic Marshall McLuhan. His book, Understanding Media, I read it, I thought it was really dumb, but there is one thing that stuck out to me. Even he mentions that TV images are so bad, they're like an abstract work of art on the pattern of a Seurat. Low res pointillism. This continued through the 1980s. Here's Reagan watching like a peasant's TV. This is even what it was like when I was a kid in the 90s, but even I've forgotten that a TV like this would have been just huge at the time. Here, let me go ahead and give you a concrete example. Breaking Bad spoiler is coming up. This shot right here is a big plot point in Breaking Bad. You have to be able to read that card. You have to know what this says. You have to be able to read this. You can't figure out a complicated story point like that on a TV like this. But, and this is key, the business is skewed to be bad too. That's a 22, all right? Don't judge me. Today we think of TV like this. Discrete little packages that are typically viewed in order and as a whole, but it was not always this way, not even close. Now imagine you're a network executive. You get one show a week, and it is chopped up in the middle for commercials, and you don't know when or where it's gonna air. And maybe most importantly, you have to fill up all this other time with content. Your show is surrounded by this other random stuff and it has to make sense in that environment. In addition, ever wonder why NBC TV came from radio rather than movies? Movie studios hated and feared TV and wouldn't lend their facilities or people. This is part of why TV comes from radio instead of film. Business models merged to try to tackle these problems. Oh, hello, just in time. So this is a clip from Public Prosecutor one of the first TV shows made for syndication. I love these early shows, they were still figuring it out. There's this one show, Jackson and Jill, and it's got the same exact beats as a modern sitcom. Oh, bright last minute ideas. No shenanigans. <laughs> but they didn't think to put a laugh track in yet. <laughs> so it's super awkward. No shenanigans. So if you're that network executive and you couldn't make your own show, you just slotted one of these syndicated shows in, a chunk like this. You can't care about the show's order or its placement because it needs to fit in anywhere. Big companies like Ziv Productions emerged. They made shows that were easy to understand, split, and rerun. People thought it was bad from the beginning. I mean, in 1960, the chairman of the FCC called it a vast wasteland. I could only find a really happy picture of him, but just imagine him being sad about TV being awful. Quickly after TV began, the nickname Idiot Box was mainstream. But it made sense for the pot of gold that they were chasing. Syndication meant that you could put a show anywhere at any time in any order, but the story had to make sense if you did that. Cincinnati WKRP. The sitcom WKRP in Cincinnati, for example, it floundered on the CBS schedule, but in syndication it was a success. And that business success greenlit a syndicated spinoff 10 years after the first show ended. This isn't to insult WKRP, it's just to say that the story choices flowed from these business and technological challenges. So what changed? All right, so you might wonder why I'm down here. It's because I want this guy to loom over me like the moon. <laughs> this is Warren Lieberfarb, and I love him. He was the head of Warner Brothers Video. This guy, he changed the tech and business model for movies, but also television as the head of Warner Home Video in the 1980s. It's a glorious logo animation, right? He was responsible for selling videotapes and rentals, but he always had an eye on the future. In the 1980s, Lieberfarb was looking to the Laserdisc. He saw problems with VHS and an opportunity with discs. I wanna break down this article because I think it's really useful. He said video rentals were flat. So he wanted a strategy that could compete with television. They wanted to sell discs, not rent them like videos. Discs could be cheaper to manufacture, even in 1989. And a disc could be stamped in 17 seconds way quicker than most VHS methods. Lieberfarb also saw that disc ownership could change behavior. If you own a movie as opposed to renting it, you can watch it at your pleasure 
or in chapters the way you'd read a book. Are you starting to see the TV connection with discs and why Lieberfarb became a warrior for DVD? By 1995, electronics firms had approved a new CD DVD, thanks to Lieberfarb's fighting for it. No format war, and Lieberfarb wanted to follow the CD pathway. So in 1996, they started selling DVD as a movie disc player. It was a big hit, really big. The biggest since TV. Now let's break down this commercial. This is DVD. They were selling DVD on the quality. Picture is twice as sharp as VHS. The sound. The sound is infinitely clearer. The special features. Listen to audio commentary. And the film library. With over 3,000 titles to choose from. Like any new technology, they discovered consumer preferences that they never could have anticipated. And in this case, it was watching a bunch of old TV episodes in order. And the good TV that was made, the TV with rich, continuous stories, that rose to the top of this new pile. Studios find success with TV on DVD. I love this article because it's like the discovery of binge watching. One guy, Gord Lacey, even started tracking all the TV on DVD on his website, TV shows on DVD. Yeah, it was it was great. And the the website was immensely popular. I remember when I launched it that first day, I had seventy thousand people. That's crazy. And and it was it was like, oh, okay, so this is a thing. Lots of shows started doing well, but the ones that resemble the golden age of TV that we are still kind of in today, the ones with intricate, continuous stories, those did really well on DVD. This is a DVD intro screen for The X-Files, one of the first big DVD TV hits. And while there were Monster of the Week episodes on The X-Files, in 1993, The X-Files looked a lot like this, a running, complex plot that rewarded attention to detail. The release of the first season on DVD let latecomers catch up seven years later. A familiar phenomenon today. Each week, we are trying to do a little movie, series creator Chris Carter said, and when you look at these shows on DVD, all that is in evidence. The suggested price for this first season was $150, $268 today. But it didn't matter. X-Files on DVD was a hit. X-Files being first season set and 24 be the first time that a show had been released before the next season aired, it allowed people to catch up. And, and then that became a thing. The same happened for The Sopranos, and the conclusion was clear. There had always been pockets of really good shows like this, Twin Peaks, 30-something, Cop Rock. Just kidding, but Cop Rock was a hilarious musical television show about police officers, so I just wanted to mention it. <laughs> TV on DVD had become huge money, and the more DVD-friendly shows were, bingeable, movie quality, complicated, the better that they sold. One person I really, really enjoyed talking to was a man by the name of Peter Stat. Fox pushed TV on DVD, and they knew what they were doing. They knew they knew how to market it. They would invest money in promoting it. I, I truly believe Peter was one of the driving forces that definitely made TV on DVD so popular. Fight evil. Bring Buffy Hall. Around the same time, this chart shows how TV sizes began a long climb from 27 inches to larger, flatter, cheaper TVs. TV got way better just as they could start showing better stuff. This is the crux of my argument. I always thought it was all about streaming, but that streaming boom is actually an epilogue to the thing that made TV good, the DVD revolution. When you start about binge watching something, you think of Netflix. People just, people just automatically go, oh yeah, Netflix, oh, I binged this, I binged that. That really came from DVD. And I think you can trace that back to the first season of 24 being released on DVD. The DVD was becoming a fifth network that viewers got to program themselves. That 2004 quote is from Chief Content Officer Ted Sarandos. He worked for then, and now runs, a company called Netflix. So why make this video? I've got two reasons. I think it debunks misconceptions about people and mediums. First, we think that these people huddled around the screen are different than us, that they were corny or naive or dumb. 
I think that this history shows that while culture changes, it also changes based on the tech and business that's used to tell stories. That matters a lot too. And that people can kind of be fundamentally the same. I also want to tell this story because of this thing. Nobody would mistake this for being the same as television, even though it lets me watch old episodes of Format Wars. Format Wars. We should be willing to accept that different media can tell different stories and have different value. TV can become profound with a few tweaks under the hood, but maybe the Apple Vision Pro is kind of bad and Maybe TikTok will always be stupid? We used to be willing to call the television the idiot box. I think we should be willing to make those value judgments again today. We will probably struggle to control the march of technology from one medium to the next one, but we can control what we spend our time on. Hey, that's it for this one. Thank you so much for watching. Is this is this creepy? No? You like my persona? Um, anyway, I've put links to all my sources in the description for this video, as well as a link to that app television that I use that let me put televisions around the room. It was kind of a cool feature. Um, thank you so much also to Gord for talking to me. I literally just saw his name in these newspaper articles, reached out to him, and got to have a great chat with him. Learned a lot and just a nice guy to talk to as well, so thank you to him. If you wanna learn more about this video from a behind the scenes perspective, I do a commentary on every video that you can find on Patreon. It's, it's a reaction video. And uh, we also chat about future video topics on that platform. So yeah, that's pretty much it for this one. I hope to see you in the next one. And in the meantime, uh, hopefully you'll never see me like this uh, again. Okay, bye.